welcome back to another episode at Access to Perspectives Conversations. And welcome, Chris and Mizwe. It's a pleasure having you here today. Thanks for joining mm. us. Thank you very much. The pleasure is mine. We met, um, I think it's about a year ago now, or longer, through um, your work with Landfrica, which we'll hear more about in this episode, and our work with Africa Archive. And then um, we stumbled a um, about each other's projects and initiatives and quickly realized that we have much in common um, where we as Africa Archive are also passionate about um, fostering multilingualism in African scholarship. Mm -hmm. And just for those who have um, who never heard about Africa Archive, we are an open access portal to incentivize or to to make it easy for African scholars and researchers to submit manuscripts, research data sets, um, posters, presentations, any research output to cloud-based digital repositories for better uh, discoverability of the research output from the continent and also for to foster collaboration across the continent and beyond. Um, so yeah, that's just for the context, but now coming to to you and your work with Landfrica, um, we run projects together, or basically one project is um, currently that we index the works that have been submitted to Africa Archive or through Africa Archive to the cloud-based repositories we partner with, and those that, um, cover or have a research on the um, on the linguistics aspect of African languages or those who are in African languages, which we have two currently. So our other submissions are in English, French, or Arabic. But um, anyway, so it's about, um, okay, maybe I should <laughs> basically give you the stage to talk about your work. Um, in more details, but basically we are now indexing the linguistic works that come into Africa Archive in Landfrica. But now the stage is yours. So um, maybe please tell us a little bit about yourself and um, and how you got to work with Landfrica and what you guys are doing. Thank you very much, Joe. Um... So I am Chris, a little background, I am, I was born in Nigeria, um, uh, to wonderful parents in Nigeria. I did my high school in Nigeria, then I got a scholarship to go to Russia for my undergraduates. And I think that's my first time in, okay, that's not my first time. So while living in Nigeria, in Nigeria there's about 200 plus, actually 500 plus languages spoken there but English is sort of the official language. So that just kind of gives this idea, you know, from a young age, I was exposed to a very diverse, um, you know, diver a place where like you can hear diverse languages, just walking a few yards, you could hear a different language. And so I think I was really exposed to this multilinguality and being trying to communicate with people from different and different languages. Mm -hmm. But I, I, um, that's the, that's one part. The other part is this kind of um, wrong perception that if you really in Nigeria that 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 was there in the society that if you really wanna if you really wanna be successful be in the top league you have to learn English and don't speak your other languages. So I sort of grew up neglecting my mother tongue, which is Igbo, and just um, improving my English language so I could be a native speaker or I wouldn't have accent or things like that. So going to Russia for my bachelor's and having to learn the Russian language in order to do my bachelor's, it also exposed me to another world of, so world of language and getting to know the culture through the language. And, and unfortunately I couldn't express my culture because I didn't know or speak my African language. So this desire to start working on my African language is what got me into NLP. So when I got to know about machine learning, I was excited about the, the things it could bring. And then I, when I knew about natural language processing, which has to do with languages, I just got attracted to it. And my main vision was to 
work on my African language and by extension work on African languages too, because this, my story is not peculiar to me. It happens to many Africans who, who live in Africa and who, who travel out. So yeah, that's how I entered into a thing we, we call Africa NLP, which is basically NLP for African languages. And it's a special division because African languages have their own special problems. They are not like English and, and the other languages. And they have very complex morphological structures. They are very tonal. And on top of that, they're very low resource. So um, very you can easily find content in English. On, on Wikipedia or on, on searching on Google, but it's hard to find content in many of these African languages online. So they're very, very low resource. So that's how I started, started my journey into Africa NLP with a couple of researchers. Um, that's how I also got to meet Masakane. And that's also what made me create Landfreaker. Um, so during my journey, I realized that one of the, one main problem, it's not that there are there aren't African language resources, you know, in the world online. It's just that they're not discoverable. So some of them are, are hidden in places. So they could be in a Google Drive or GitHub or places like that. So um, my, my second main journey was into how do I help make these things more discoverable? And when I say more discoverable, it's not really, you know, in terms of SEO optimization and things like that. It's more about having a kind of a, a central hub where you can come and easily find them. So that was the, it's about information retrieval um, from my perspective. Because um, I believe if it's very easy to find these things, then it's um, researchers can, can build on them. Um, they can be progress in that in that domain, if it's easy to find what has been done already. But if it's very hard, if you have to spend weeks just finding what has been done already in that domain, you lose interest. Um, I heard, I've heard a lot of, a number of students um, in Germany who say they wanna do their master's thesis on an African language, but it's so hard to find real, related works in the language. And many times they give up, they have to, you know, it's, they have to produce something to their supervisor. So they end up changing the la languages. So it's not that these related works don't exist. It's just that they're very hard to find them. They're in closed journals. They are in, you know, you cannot just find it by typing on Google search. So yeah, this is what Africa is about. It's about creating a, a place where you can come and easily find these resources. So. In order to make that work, we rely a lot on collaborations and, and a thing we call linking resources. So um, we take the metadata of the resources wherever they are hosted and we put it on our website. So basically our website is like, a, our website tells you, okay, this is the name, the title of the resource. This is a short description. And this is the link that takes you back to the, original host of the resource. So that's, we call it linking resources. We believe that um, I envision this, you know, it's just kind of like an, a graph of, of links that you know take you to different places where you can find these resources. Yeah, so that's what we're doing in Landfreaker. We rely on collaboration because we have to collaborate with some of the, um, the data repositories or organizations like Africa Archive, for example, has a very huge repository of, of articles around Africa and around, you know, in, in Africa. So collaborating with um, or partnering with Africa Archive is some of the ways that allow us to really do achieve our vision of linking, linking them. Um, so for example, the, the partnership, through the partnership and uh, we were able to uh, link about 239 articles uh, from Ar Africa Archive, um, link them on Landfreaker. Um, mm. Yeah, so that's it about Landfreaker and about me. Excellent, thank you so much for, for yeah, sharing that, um, so much about the background of your work and um, where your interests were, was coming from in the first place. How many um, languages um, are represented in the Lanfrica database currently? Um, so currently we, ha we have, we have accounted for about 2,189 plus languages. Uh, yes, that's, um, of course, many of these languages 
don't have many resources. Some mm -hmm. even have zero. But what we tried to do was we said, let's really go do our research and try to get as many of these languages as possible and really have them there. Because um, it's not just about the languages that have resources. It's also about the ones that don't have resources. Because if you know about them, then you can know, OK, mm -hmm. these ones don't have resources. I should probably work on them. So yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And um, I know from a work with Wikimedia that the Wikipedia um, team and, and uh, communities are passionate about making Wikipedia as multilingual as ever possible. And they have huge difficulties um, in bringing multilingualism of Wikipedia content to African languages, just because I think the community base is maybe not as strong, and also because of the reluctance of, as you just said, of Africans to, or reluctance, and maybe also not not having enough knowledge of the the indigenous languages, unfortunately, anymore. So, but um. But for your research, is has Wikipedia itself been a useful source to get hold of what languages even exist? And as yeah, that's the first question, and a couple more in that regard. Um, so in in my NLP research, um, uh, Wikipedia has been a huge source because most of the data sets that we use in NLP research kind of have a, a root in Wikipedia. So it could be Wikipedia articles that were cleaned or something was done to pre-processed in some way. And then you have a, they give it a new name, but mm -hmm. it's from Wikipedia. So yeah. And especially the data sets that have some African languages, uh, most times it's either from Wikipedia or it's from web crowd. But if it's cleaner, if it's more reliable, then it's mostly from Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Wikipedia has had a huge impact there. Um, in terms of Landfreaker, um, I don't really know. Um, I mean, yeah, Landfreaker, we link those data sets because they're important for those languages. So, yeah, but I, I, don't, I don't think I have used Wikipedia to know, um, you know, what African languages exist and which ones have not enough articles or, or things like that. No, yeah. No. And yeah, talking about Wiki Wikipedia, I just mean because I know Wikipedia itself also has lists of language families and like categories, which then is based on Wikidata, which might be a useful resource. But I can imagine, I haven't checked myself, I can imagine that also the content on Wikidata is they're not exhaustive for African languages that you'll find there. And then the coverage on Wikipedia on the individual languages, well, as you as you also said earlier, um, surely differs. Like bigger language groups are better covered and described, um, also culturally contextualized. Um, whereas, so so to say, smaller languages or smaller language groups are not not even mentioned or have an empty stub or you know have just a few lines of text to describe. Um, and what other sources do you, did you refer to to get to the number like almost 3,000 languages? Like where, um, where, where did you find the ones that are not in Wikipedia and Wikidata? Um, so I, I, I remember when I first started and I was looking for a place that had, you know, had a, had this comprehensive list of African languages, not just the popular ones, but even the ones that no one has heard of. I was looking at places. Um, I think I, I knew about Glottolog, but not that much, but it was SIL. SIL has a database of, of, of languages and, it's um, grouped by continent. So they have like a huge database with the complete with the ISO 6393 code. So I, that was the place that I found what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. The first place I found it and that's what I used. So yeah, that was the place I used. Then at the point I, I um, because even that one didn't have 
didn't have all the languages. And as I was, as we were adding resources, we were realizing that this this thing is not complete. So we're kind of now adding the new languages that it didn't have. And you, I remember where I was using Wikipedia to learn about these languages. It's like, wow, this is a language that's spoken. So you could have a country and you could have like one language is spoken in this region, another language is spoken in this region. So Wikipedia would give those that kind of information, like it's spoken in the Western part or is or is 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 spoken, but it's also uh, called this other language. So I was using Wikipedia to to learn about these languages. So um, yeah, those were my sources. Oh. Um, going mm -hmm. further, I, I I learned that Glottolog, I think they said Glottolog has a much more comprehensive list, especially with the coding. So I plan to explore that and explore other sources. Mm -hmm. That was quite an investigative effort. And now I, I know that this is probably not only in Africa, but especially in Africa, some languages are considered dialects, which by African native speakers are considered an insult because they are two distinct languages, um, which from a Western categorization point of view, and maybe also for the sheer number of languages that exist on the continent, maybe some scholars from the West were overwhelmed by that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Just, just making <laughs> assumptions, or was out of pure ignorance. I don't know. But to, would you like to elaborate a lot, little bit more about this kind of dissonance of what to what what classifies as a distinct language versus a dialect? Um. So I I really don't think like. Uh, it's in my power to do that, just because yeah. Yeah, I cannot. I I I don't want to just use the linguistic properties of the language and just label it. I think one has to also kind of leave experience the language, you know, mm -hmm. maybe meet the speakers, try to speak it. So I, I even when I am I'm trying to find, get the languages and put on Landfrica, I don't really try to put any, I try very hard not to put some additional labels or things. I just try to get it as it is and just put it there and and um, what's important is the name of the language um the, the meaning um, some like where you can wikipedia is a good source to learn more about the language when it exists and then if it has a resource or not um going into whether it's a dialect or not <laughs> i don't think i'm the i don't think i have the you know i am the best person to do that so i yeah. try not to really go there but if it's a language that has been because there are some languages that have gone through debates and then finally there's like a decision on it. So um, you, you would you would see that on Wikipedia, for example, or somewhere. Then those ones, I you know, I take that metadata. But if it's the languages that are still going on the you know going through some debate. So for example, there are also languages that um, you don't know where to put which language group to put them. So mm -hmm. sometimes you just put them somewhere, and or sometimes you leave them out. So. Languages going through the base, I just take the essential information and just um, link them. Yeah, also, like in my experience and understanding of languages, they're also constantly evolving, like our cultures. They're never a status quo. So the categorization by whoever applies categories might also change over time. And then True. challenged by other individuals who, I would say. Mm -hmm. Um, or who are invited to the discourse. <laughs> um, obviously, those the, who make it. it yeah. Uh, the, obviously, we're hoping that the decision making is as inclusive as can be and also involves actual speakers of that language. Um, but I think that's increasingly the case, hopefully. Not on wood. And yeah. So, so that was another question. And then what? What are your hopes for how, or what is your roadmap for Lanfrica? I like, will there ever be a completion of the project that you can foresee? Are there other kind of um, diverse projects that you see emerge from the activities and the, the active and potential partners that you get to meet over the course of the activities? and speaking engagements where you present like what 
like in other words, like you know, you might want to say what's the potential of like, yeah, what what's the roadmap for Landbreaker? And where would you like to see it moving next? And what's the timeline or when is the next milestone, so to say? Are you working from milestone to milestone? Not like like how many resources do you think, I don't know, like it also depends on people working on these languages. You don't really have authority. But yeah, basically, what is your approach and the foresight of, of the activities and projects coming up? Um, yeah, it's first of all, the roadmap and the foresight is a work in progress. So it's not like a fixed mm -hmm. roadmap. It's something I keep trying to um, come to and you know look from a broader perspective um but uh, my vi so my vision with Lanfrica um Lanfrica was not just about linking resources linking resources was like the first step mm -hmm. for me Lanfrica is, is is about like trying to so when we as a researcher, when I enter Africa NLP, um, I'm hit with all these, these are the problems, lack of discoverability, lack of focus. Um, people don't, the Africans don't care about their languages or they're you know, they more into trying to get out and speak. So this, then there's, when you say lack of data or low resource data, how do you really make more data come in? Is it just by hiring a group of people to create this data? So, or translate some English English news or some BBC news or something or Fox News into African languages. There's a lot of, um, you know, we're not so sure. We're trying the best we can, but I believe that um, the way one way to really create an in African content or African data is to actually get people to use the language. Um, and to use the language, to interact with the language, um, to use, you know, to, to, to actually experience the language. That aside, that, that has nothing to do with the, the roadmap plan. But I'm just trying to say, you know, Lanfrica, you know, the, the goal of Lanfrica, like when we say languages of Africa, it's like, you know, helping to make these languages of Africa to kind of be assimilated into, into the world and people using it. And that involves like being used in language technologies in some ways like in social media um, so these are, these are some of the things that really I aspire to or the kind of the future I see in the next um, in the next couple of years or maybe 10 one two decades this is kind of the future I envisage where you can talk with Alexa in your African language where you can see content on the news in your language um, it's, it's a bit it's an ambitious um, vision so I try to also look for pragmatic things that we can do currently what we're doing with Landfreaker so we have linking resources um, there so we have we're creating a platform to make it easier for people to link their resource themselves mm -hmm. and for people to find resources. So that's there. And I'm also, we're also looking into automatic ways of getting these resources, probably kind of crawling the web, finding them and putting them so that you don't have, you have less manual effort there. Of course, there'll be manual reviews and stuff. So linking resources is there, but I'm, the other things that Land Free Curry is trying to uh, branch into or go into or look into uh, um, so that we now we have this thing called Africa talks which is um, it's trying to address another problem where you have there's a lot of hype and and attention on large efforts in NLP or in languages in general so there's a lot of you know you only see, almost you only see results of people you only see tweets and attention from people who have published papers in big conferences or, or companies that have built huge models. Mm -hmm. But the small efforts of people, you don't see them anywhere. So we're trying to tackle that problem by creating a space where these people can share their efforts and we, uh, we host them and then we release it online so that the world can watch and posterity can also um, get to know about these things. So that's one space we are in. Mm -hmm. um, another space we're really looking, we're not looking, we're really investing in and currently working on is the is the data, data, especially data selling, so data marketplaces. And we're trying to 
work in that area for African data sets because another problem with another problem um, I noticed is some you have um, researchers, linguists, or people with data, but they are scared to put their data anywhere because they know that unfortunately, eventually what happens is, you know, the, the data is out there on the web and some big people, organizations with, with the resources, crawl your data, use your data, train the models, create the service and sell it back to you. Mm -hmm. So this is a thing that has been going on since and is a thing that we, that keeps going on. And um, so you have some people who they don't want to put their resources out there and, and it feels bleak, but finally Africa is seeing something we can do about that in the data marketplace section. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to, yeah, that's a, that's a big thing that I'm very, very passionate about. And yeah, we're, uh, we're still doing the you know, market research, trying to understand how really we can help and things like that. But that's one place I'm really looking into. Um, in the future, um, so in the future, Lanfrica is, is, is when you hear, when you hear Lanfrica, you know, it's about this effort to really do something about the state of African data sets in the world. You know, it's, it's, it's easy to talk about it and to let people know and, and hope that the policies or the governments will do something. But, um, I think Lanfrica is me for taking you know concrete pragmatic steps towards that of course it it's not big steps but i think it's helpful no matter how small it is it's actually doing something about it for yeah. sure yeah absolutely and you you mentioned quite a few like highly uh important issues and also opportunities for to protect um like what we're also concerned about with africa archive is data ownership like when there's anarchist research about any African, not, not only languages, but as well, um, but any African topic, um, also African animal and plant species, um, ownership should and must remain with the African people. But as many of us will realize and quickly understand and find it also quite normal to happen is that the ownership it's transferred to the researchers and then the Western industries um, and being exploited. And then no African stakeholders would have any say on, on the products that are being developed. So similar to what you just described. And by our approach to um, enable African researchers to, um, or basically making making is they can already do that but to to show them the venues where that is possible digitally um, to apply open licenses where the ownership remains for the people in the research communities and this is also embedded in the national and institutional settings another level of complexity then is which i also talked with nicholas Uta about in a previous episode um, it's helicopter research, which what he said also sometimes within the country, where researchers, helicopter research is normally known as um, researchers come from um, often Western countries, um, work together with African researchers, to collect data and, and gain regional and local knowledge, but then publish the results um, often without the African colleagues. And those then might be mentioned in the acknowledgement, but otherwise have no um, no participation in um, yeah in the ownership of the data, let alone being acknowledged for the contribution to the research project. Um, and that is also hopefully slowly changing, but there's still cases um, of that happening. Um, and then Ota and I can also link the episode in the show notes. He mentioned that sometimes it's also difficult for, in this case, Kenyan researchers working with local communities and then finding themselves doing the same mistakes, <laughs> like not knowing or having no means in the scholarly system to acknowledge the fishermen and like non-scholars they work with or community members. But, um, but also for that, there are solutions now. And he himself and his team and the people that he works with, they are doing wonderful work and 
fully engaging with the communities and all the stakeholders of the research projects, informing them, empowering them, um, informing them of any research that is um, already published or in their own results and how they can improve fish farming in the region. Um, some of the research and uh, knowledge that is basically published as research, which the fishermen might not be aware of why the fish species are declining, what the reasons are, and things like that. Or, and then of course, also the other way around, the fishermen sharing their experience and very well understanding the connection between climate change and, and the shrinkage of the lakes and rivers. But, um, and now there, are, so there are, um, on like from Canada, also Australia, and other countries, there are best practices and also evolving standards and um, categories, but also archiving systems for ensuring that knowledge remains with the people and the knowledge holders, and that attribution attribution is being shared in accordance to the actual contribution that is being um, executed throughout the research project. Um, but yeah, but there's still a lot of unawareness of these emerging features and standards and projects and best practices um, and a lot of, yeah. So there's still some work to do for, for us and others to, to inform about the possibilities to yeah, to ensure ownership of research data and knowledge systems and to protect knowledge from misappropriation in any regard. Okay, but let's come back to, to languages or was there anything that came to mind? Any uh, when you were saying this, I was thinking like, you know, you're, you're very right. And, you know, part of the thing with, with AI in Africa is that, um, these policies, these rules, and these um, regulations that have been set up in other countries. So you have GDPR in in Europe. You have some rules in Canada, and like and the things you mentioned, you know they they are not um, they are not they are not enforced enforced in mm. in many African countries. Mm. I use the word enforced because I've come to see that some of them are there. So you have the Malabo Convention mm -hmm. and others. So but I, the good news is that um, uh, people, the, the people involved, so the officials, the, the key researchers and stakeholders are actually now working on trying to write up some of these policies. So it would take time. And what, I'm, what I also learned is that we don't, like we as researchers or people who want to do something, we don't have to wait for that. We can do what we can do while waiting for of that course, to happen. Yeah, that's yeah, thanks for adding that. Um, and there are very well, I'm, I'm sharing, I'm just sharing two links. Like one is the care principles, the complement the care principles, which we have also talked about in previous episodes before, um, which concerns more ownership rights and ethics, and then as well, local context is the example from the United States and Canada, and I think Australia is also involved where. Um, they work with indigenous communities and try to protect traditional knowledge and indigenous knowledge, um, which is doesn't fit the scholarly um, kind of ownership of data, ownership of knowledge scheme. And then, as you also mentioned, and what should totally be um, explored is existing policies in the respective country where the research is being done. Yeah, that often exists, and researchers, you know, always have a duty in informing themselves and getting the rights and the approvals by the authorities to conduct research in a certain manner, and mm -hmm. always apply the highest possible ethical standards and legal standards, mm -hmm. and not only to the Western perspective, but you know, in agreement with um, any stakeholder and cultural background that is concerned. Oh, sure. um, so yeah, and also just use our brain to what is an equitable sharing of and, and respectful um, 
project approach, research approach in the first place. And there are plenty of resources and best practices that can be research can be found online and through um, various institutions who concern themselves with with these. And yeah, I mean the. As you said, like it's like the difficulty might be that international standards might not be um, enforced on the national level either way. Um, but yet there are certainly opportunities to coincide with the with the mis with, with the stakeholders concerned to find agreements and have MOUs before the project starts. Uh, so, right. mm -hmm. So how the knowledge can be extracted and how it's being shared back to the communities. So not extracted, sure. but you kind know, of cumulatively um, build up on for every mm -hmm. benefit that should always be the goal. Yeah. Another thing I would like to talk about is, you know, I would also like to, you know, ask you, what do you think? It seems to me that some of these community first initiatives don't always get um um don't always get you know attract investors and funders so for example when you look at nlp right now there's a, there are so many startups that just keep popping up on trying to use models to create services and um very good services like paraphrasing summarizing or down to you know generating text so using models the nlp models and um, even though these models have been shown to have bias, but you know you have startups, and these startups get some really good series and funding. But then, when you have initiatives like this, so like people just trying to create a platform for open access or for to make make some marginalized communities more discoverable, they don't. You know, when I look, when I browse through TechCrunch or just look at list of startups, I don't see things like that. You know. And so it seems to me like, you know, these initiatives of trying to maybe create a system where maybe like Africa Cav is trying to do, trying to create open access, um, yeah, more information, more access to information for about Africa or Latin Africa, you know, it's, it's not so easy to mm. attract investors. What do you think about that? Yeah, I have the same experience, but I think it's not out of a lack of interest for many potential donors, but uh, lack of, yeah, I think like what eventually attracts investments and donations is a uh, prospect of economical revenue, unfortunately. And I think value-based initiatives often cannot provide for that. Like when will this be self-sustaining? Um, because it is a long road to to work, yeah. but and I think many investors just don't have the time, patience for that to materialize. Um, there are a few niche niche um, communities also to uh, to look into alternative funding streams and community based um, funding approaches. Um, mm -hmm. We are also, we, how do you say, like, we use Open Collective for, um, an Open collective, collective is many things, and also a fundraising platform for open mm -hmm. source projects, um, but also a means to make cash flow transparent, to basically also showcase efficiency and expenditure and um, revenue that's being generated, even if small, but um, and I think like many philanthropic projects or projects that um, are built towards depending on philanthropic investments or, or donations are not as strong on the economic food, but mm -hmm. that's needed in the system for sustainability of the services. Um, and I think like for myself, researchers and NGO people and people who are values driven often fear commercialism and capitalistic approaches. Um, whereas maybe a healthy mix is in between. And this is, I think, what many 
representative from both extremes are, or not the extremes, but from both professional settings are working towards. And that then can have a good mix of knowledge about you know, what's needed, what a project planning project. I'm not saying we, you and I don't do that. We're also researchers. We can design projects and follow through. Um, yeah, so I think basically what it boils down to is maybe like what, what keeps the project alive? If we look at it from a nutritional point of view and not so much financial, but from the finances, because that often triggers a lot of fear in many of us just mm -hmm. to think about or a lot of misconceptions or bad experiences and observations made. Um, so yeah, it's, I think it's, it's a mindset thing from my personal experience <laughs> to like not wanting to worry so much about the finances, but it's needed as a tool to keep the project alive and going. And everybody said, like, you know, everybody works on the project to get food on the table um, to keep going. Yeah, it's I agree. But I, I think your question was like, there's not too many opportunities in funding, funding like grant proposal or proposals mm -hmm. and announcements mm -hmm. in that scheme and yeah I guess there should be more but I think also in the times that we live in today with conflicts climate change all around and so many extremes going on and in a digitally interconnected world where things are feel as if, if they are as close as the next doorstep when something happens in the other end of the world. Mm -hmm. um, there's also lots of opportunities for, for many wake up calls to happen. And I think that's also happening. And yeah. It's a matter of what I'm really realizing is a matter of opening up to like being and staying open to like minded initiatives and joining forces like we did. <laughs> like, where's the overlap where we can support each other? Um, yeah, where can we support each other and what are each organization's strength, strengths? Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, submitting funding proposals together to build a much stronger case which with a much better outcome as each of our organizations alone could achieve. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, that's also an option. And this is happening. I mean, yeah small scale and I think we also grow into bigger budgets over the years mm -hmm. uh, with experience. It's yeah. a matter of, as you said yourself, like observing the market, being in the market for some time, learning the rules, learning about the stakeholders and then being a stakeholder within networking. And that's how eventually, yeah the money that drives the project to success will also find its way or will be in reach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, I look, I completely agree with you. Yeah. I think like similar, um, similar things I've also seen in, in research projects, like there is always trend trending topics like cancer research will always get money because there is a demand for it, there's an industry for it. Um, but then more, so to say, exotic topics, like I was busy or I was engaged in the evolution and development niche of researchers, which is I don't know, five or so groups around the world studying this topic. Um, and basically, decoding the animatory of life. So it was quite essential. And I think now the community has grown bigger, but at the time we were really not so many. I mean, maybe more than five, but you know, less than, I think less than a hundred researchers in total with all the PhD students and PIs involved. Mm -hmm. And for us at the time, it was always difficult to find the money to keep the research going. Mm -hmm. Whereas for any Drosophila lab or you know, this, with established model organisms, or mice, studying cancer. I mean, there's also high competition in, in the number of research labs competing for the money, but there's a bigger part to grab from. Um, 
Yeah, and in our case, I think it's also a model like developing services, like other than academia, where we are service providers and standalone organizations at the intersection with academia. It's also a matter of how can we monetize what we've learned through the organization. And it's not that you also um, mentioned something that you're investigating opportunities there or protecting from misappropriation and monetization. Um, True. But yeah, there's nothing wrong with fair, fair fees and amounts for fair services. True. Um, I agree. And that's, yeah, I believe also like the digital tools, mm. like this is also a topic I often talk about digital tools in research um, across the research workflow and how they, mm. they are funded and sustained financially. Mm -hmm. The best bet is always a mixed approach. Mm. Like not to rely on just one funding source, but to do yeah. more than one. And yeah, just keep all like more than one also happy and, and flowing. So that when one source ceases to provide and yeah, this the stream of influx for, for finances then there's the project will not die, but can continue even if mm -hmm. it's with less um, investments, but then, yeah, new new investors can come in. Yeah. yeah it's a, I think it's a learning that many researchers um, have to learn anew with all the skills that we've established, um, like a, a tremendous skill set um, that each researcher comes with. Each, each researcher comes with, but then running our own projects, which are kind of at the intersection with academia and entrepreneurship, or as well nonprofit organizations, like is a, another level, is basically a whole other um, kind of workflow, but it's not so different, but it's, an, it's another dimension to consider. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree with that. And sometimes it's frustrating. And then there's also opportunities that arise. Like that's like true. That's, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's not a straight path. It's you know it's filled of ups and filled with ups and downs. But it's all part of the experience and part of growing. Yeah, I believe. I wanted to ask you, like, from your personal view and also maybe experiences through your work, how would you say is culture embedded in language? And um, I just want to contextualize this because I'm personally involved in also with both our teams with Access to Perspectives and Africa Archive, we're involved and engaged in um, multilingualism and translating research um, initiatives. Um, one of which is also with Masakana. And one thing that I've come to realize is like translating research is, can never be fully holistic in a sense, like because language itself carries so much cultural context. And therefore it's also oftentimes in many disciplines, if not all, if you look closely enough, um, by having to translate into English or another language from a regional research study that was conduct conducted in another language and then you translate it into English, loses a lot of that cultural context in my view and kind of anticipation or kind of assumption. Um, and then you might argue about yeah, physics, math, and other more technical research topics, maybe not. And maybe yes, I don't know. But what's your impression? How much um, culture matter when it comes to languages? Um... Okay, I, I will start with a personal point of view because as someone who, uh, so I went to Russia and studied in Russian and then I also came to Germany even though I'm studying in English. So I've had interaction with different cultures and the language. So what I have seen is that, so the, the culture is is um, what's the definition of you know culture is like the values the traditions what defines the people their way of life 
Um, you could also include their way of thinking. Um, so it's all these things. It's very abstract. So um, you cannot see it. You cannot touch it. You cannot interact with it, with this culture of the people. But the language helps you to kind of now interact with that culture. So I'm not talking of translating. I'm talking of speaking in that language, you know, or trying to learn that language. For you know, when you try to learn a Russian, for example, you know, you kind of shift your mentality from the way you think mm -hmm. in English. Um, so there's this the mentality shift is kind of bringing you closer to, you know, the way they express themselves. You know, which is the culture. So this is how language, in my in my, one way, in my in my view, from my experience, that language helps you interact or with or connect with the culture. Um, another way is, another way is so, it, I, I see it as like the language and the culture, like different cultures are like different worlds and you, you could be in your world and never know of another world. But when you learn the language, then suddenly you're like, whoa, there's this whole world out there. A world because it's a different way of thinking. So one, one um one when I got one this realization was um so I was learning Russian and usually when I'm searching for things on Google I type in English and Google gives me English responses and you get many Western views mm. or European views you know on this question mm. but then I think once I tried to search for something in Russian and then it's a a whole so I tried to search for the same thing in Russian because I didn't get in uh, I wasn't getting the, the thing I was looking for and then I searched for the same thing in Russian and it's like a whole new world out there I was like wait what so like even this web has like a different world with and is the world is different not just because it's in Russia but because even the the way of explaining you know where they're coming from to explain the same meaning it's completely different so you can see this in in African languages, like if you're translating English to African language, mostly what you're doing is just transferring the culture or the Western, the perspective into another language. It's not really interacting with the culture of the African language. So this might explain why you're saying like it loses, you lose some value if you're, because even if you're transferring, you cannot transfer everything so well, but we can manage it. Um, and but if you if you create content in the African language, so like the person you talked about interacting with the fishermen, um, you know, talking with them, it shows you a different way of thinking. You know, this is you know very interesting mindset perspective to life that is why it's so different from the Western most of the Western point of view. So this is how I. And you can only do that if you interact in in that in that language. This is why, um, like um, they say, if you talk to a man in a language he understands, it gets to his head. But if you talk to a man in his language, it gets to his heart. So mm -hmm. if you speak to someone in their language, then they can give you, you know, from their heart, you know, the, the things, the, the way of life, way of thinking, which you would surprisingly see that is completely different from mm -hmm. the way of other in other languages. So I see language as a way to communicate with this abstract thing called culture, which is just person, the mentality, the values, what the, you know, perspective on life and all these things. And you cannot see these things, you cannot connect with it, but mm -hmm. through language, you can communicate with that. This is how language um, connects to culture, in my opinion. Yeah, I share many of your experiences. And like when I learned Swedish in my undergraduate studies, it felt like a whole new world is opening up to me. Like, and other than seeing the landscape, like actually diving into the culture by knowing the language to some extent i wouldn't you know uh, i'm i'm not a native speaker level but <laughs> but i knew well enough that after saying a couple of sentences the swedes would not ask where which country are you coming from rather which which part of sweden are you from i was like what okay that's big <laughs> but i hadn't said a lot until then <laughs> but um yeah it's it's really and, and also I like the personality sh personality shift, like I speak in another language, but I have to say that actually also happens to me when I speak another German dialect. Uh, like I cannot help but adopt the dialect that's kind of spoken to me too. 
even if I don't know so well, but I I mirror the same kind of intonation that the dialect comes with. And I've lived some time in Bavaria and um, also uh, Baden-Württemberg, like the yeah the other south southern region. Um, yeah, and it's it's actually difficult for me to keep speaking what's known as high German or classical German. Um, yeah, I don't think my personality shifts as much as then with dialects as it does with speaking other languages. Because you have a by by being in the country with the people and speaking the language, you actually also experience to some extent the culture and the upbringing, like what they went through. Um, but of course, not living through the whole thing, but you know, understanding the context mm -hmm. of the region mm -hmm. to an extent, and that comes with some mind shift, which is hard to explain. Yeah, for somebody who didn't experience that. Yeah, and it it happens suddenly to me also with English, and with English it's more complicated because there's so many dialects, if you wish, or there's so many types of English with Canadian uh australian british american like inside britain there's some britain has so many dialects and forms and types and then yeah. also i i would also say there's kenyan english there's nigerian english like because yeah the english was then also informed by the regional um original words that found themselves into the spoken english um so yeah so in the, on South African, um, so there are so many varieties of English. Um, but I remember, I think I was not in school or during school time when I spent some weeks in England for a language course, like suddenly got me. It's also when some people say, okay, now I started dreaming in that language. Um, there's a threshold that or gate that you at some point walk through to enter the culture through the language, it feels yeah. like, like it's yeah, it's that's useful. true. Uh, wow. Okay, <laughs> that's almost or it is very much philosophical from being highly technical in the beginning of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but I think yeah. it, it brings home the point that we're both making about the importance of language diversity. Yeah, preserving or. I'm not sure if preserving is the right word, but documenting language as much as possible, like you do, um, or kind of building a catalog of the documented works of the African languages. Um, so just to come back to land precast, for you, it's not important um, that there is, or not yet, maybe, it's better to say, that each glossary of, on a certain language or works that you index into the Lamprica database is of a certain data um, format or in a certain repository, but rather to to showcase what's out there. Yes, yes. As long as it's it's about African something, uh, for now African languages. Yeah, yeah, and and it's um. Of course, it has to be uh, not off. It's you know, it, it's off and it's also for. So it's, for example, if it's a research, it has to be in you know, like a or an article. It has to be, um, what's the word? It has you know, it has to be an article that's helpful and useful. For example, for example, we cannot take an article that is 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 I don't know, lambasted in African languages and put there. No, it, it has to be an article that beneficial to the African language community. So that's just what I want to say. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, so we will put the link to our website, of course, in the show notes. So whoever is listening, you can find all the also mentioned resources and organizations um, yeah. in the show notes and uh, the affiliated blog post, where we also learn a bit more about, um, about yourself and your online profiles, um, where people can get in touch with you. Um, I'm very glad we're collaborating and give more opportunities to engage. You're most welcome back to the show anytime you want to share a milestone from Africa or in other projects that that you're working on. Um, yeah, thanks for joining today.
Thank you. So much. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, thank you for hosting me. I'm very happy to be here and also very looking forward to more um, projects that we do with Africa Archive. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you.